Well, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us this week for our moment of ministry. And it's hard to believe that we are uh, entering into the fifth month of doing this. We set this up months ago. We had no idea that it would keep going. So the set doesn't change. We're still in my living room, very low tech, glad you're here. And uh, I want to begin today by uh, reminding you of something you probably heard a long time ago. It's a fable by Aesop, and it's, it's about an old man and his grandson who are traveling to a village to sell a donkey. And so they start off on the road, and uh, uh, because he's elderly, the, the, the grandpa kind of hops on the donkey, and the son's just walking, and they pass somebody, and somebody just starts criticizing and going off on him and says, you know, I can't believe that you uh, w would expect this young boy to walk, and you would take the luxury of riding, and, and the guy felt bad, and so he, he thought, you know what, he, they're right, so he put his grandson on the donkey, and he walked. And then they get a little farther along and they pass two women and the two women just started criticizing the boy. How could you do this? How could you look so much for yourself and out for yourself? And, and your grandpa is actually having to walk. And, and, and so uh, they thought, well, the grandpa didn't know what to do. So he decided we should just both ride the donkey. So they both got on the donkey and they went a little bit farther. And again, sure enough, passed some people and they just started criticizing him and going, God, you, I, the poor donkey, you're overloading the poor donkey. Do you not care about anyone but yourself? And so they felt bad, and so they went a little bit further, and, and then they were, they were walking the donkey, and then people became really critical. You know, the two of them were walking, and the donkey was walking. What a total waste of a good animal. You could, you could use that donkey to ride, and, and they just didn't know what to do. And, and I, I think how the story finally ends is they come into the village, and man's actually carrying the donkey. Uh, I, I don't know how it ends, but here, here's what I, I, I want to just talk about. It is so easy in this day that we live in to become hypercritical of others. And, and I want to connect something that um, maybe we don't think about, but when we become hypercritical, we become hyper angry. And a, a critical attitude usually leads to justified anger in our minds. And, and what ultimately happens when we become that critical is we tend to polarize into one of two extremes. Uh, and, and you see this in politics all the time. And it's really easy to get to where what you see, you see it is perfectly right and every other point of view is wrong and, and you can become very judgmental and very condemning and, and condescending to people who are different. What I want to do right now is because of what I did last week, I showed you a little video in this message, got good feedback from that. So I want to do the same thing today. I want to take you back at least a decade. I think it might actually go two decades back. I don't know exactly when uh, the comedian John Gleese did a, a little sketch on extremism and he was just talking about how easy it is to, uh, to look at somebody who's on the other side of whatever spectrum you're on and find fault with them and criticize them. And so what I want to do is I actually want to show you this. And again, I'm not making any political statement. He's going to talk about the left. He's going to talk about the right. He's just going to talk about the, the attitudes that can start to form in our brain. So I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to ask you to just watch this and I'll jump back in. Seriously, though, we've heard a lot about extremism recently, a nastier, harsher atmosphere everywhere, more abuse and bother boy behavior, less friendliness and tolerance and respect for opponents. All right, but what we never hear about extremism is its advantages. Well, the biggest advantage of extremism is that it makes you feel good because it provides you with enemies. Let me explain. The great thing about having enemies is that you can pretend that all the badness in the whole world is in your enemies and all the goodness in the whole world is in you. Attractive, isn't it? So, if you have a lot of anger and resentment in you anyway, and you therefore enjoy abusing people, then you can pretend that you're only doing it because these enemies of yours are such very bad persons. And that if it wasn't for them, you'd actually be good-natured and courteous and rational all the time. So, if you want to feel good, become an extremist. Okay, now you have a choice. If you join the hard left, they'll give you their list of authorized enemies. Almost all kinds of authority, especially the police, the city, Americans, judges, multinational corporations, public schools, furriers, newspaper owners, fox hunters, generals, class traitors, and, of course, moderates. Or, if you'd rather be an extremist on the hard right, no problem, fine, you still get a lovely list of enemies, only they're different ones. Noisy minority groups, unions, Russia, weirdos, demonstrators, welfare sponges, meddlesome clergy, peaceniks, the BBC, strikers, social workers, communists, and, of course, moderates. 
and upstart actors. Now, once you're armed with one of these super lists of enemies, you can be as nasty as you like and yet feel your behaviours morally justified. So you can strut around uh, abusing people and telling them you could eat them for breakfast and still think of yourself as a champion of the truth, a, a fighter for the greater good, and not the rather sad paranoid schizoid that you really are. Well, I don't know if you enjoyed that, but I hope you were informed by it. Because the truth of the matter is, is we can become absolutely nasty, harsh people but because we feel we're right and everybody else is wrong. And I just believe that in this time that we're living through, for reasons I'm going to explain in just a moment, I just think we're becoming more and more angry, more and more full of contempt, more and more judgmental, and more and more condescending. And we are justifying venting our anger at other people as if somehow this is, this is, this is okay. Now, again, if you don't walk with Jesus, it, it, hey, you're your own boss. You know, you're going to do what you want to do. But those of us who have submitted our lives to Jesus need to again realize we will be held accountable for the things that we say. And I think the word of God is so clear in informing us to be very, very careful. And so what I want to do with what we say, I want to read to you a passage. Actually, I want to read several passages, but um, so a, a critical attitude leads to justified anger and we just feel like we can do this. But, uh, and, then, and then we say things, all of us, all of us have said things in anger that we wish we could take back. We just go, I don't know what I was thinking. I was, I don't, my, this red hot rage, this, you know, just took over. And then we say it and we can't get the words back. It's like feathers to the wind. You just can't go recapture them. And, and you wish you could, but the damage is done. But here's what Proverbs 15.1 says. Listen carefully. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, let me just point something out. A gentle answer is not needed. The point of this is not a gentle answer for a gentle issue. A gentle answer, when you want to say the harsh word, is what it's commending. A gentle answer calms harsh anger. And, and you, it's the, the best response. A harsh word, it's just going to inflame it, and it's going to get worse and worse. Now, I want to share with you, because I love, this, is the, this to me is the greatest part of our time on Wednesday, is we just have time to go into the Old Testament, talk about stories that are in the Old Testament we don't necessarily... Uh, spend enough time in church on because of you know so everything's moving so fast so it gives us time to get into the word of God there is a classic story about a, a gentle answer uh, turning away wrath um, and, and so let me explain to what's going on so David he's uh, on his way to becoming king he's he's got his warriors he's got you know he's like his band of brothers and they're kind of running around and and uh, he's a force to be reckoned with and, and people know of him well, he's uh, hanging out in one particular region, and he's watching over uh, some guy's flocks. Now, let me just pick the story up, okay? I'm going to be in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. And let me, i got to just read this because there's so much of this that is so good, so listen carefully. A certain man in Maon who had property uh, there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which uh, he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. Uh, she was an intelligent and a beautiful woman. But her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite, okay? Um, uh, he, this guy would, would, this is, this guy's a businessman you don't want to deal with. This guy is just angry and mean and takes advantage of everything. Well, you'll see that in just a minute. So while David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent 10 young men and said to them, go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, good health, and, 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 to you and, and to your household, and, and good health to all that is yours. Now, now I hear that uh, it, it's sheep shearing time, and when your shepherds were with us, uh, we, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were in Carmel, uh, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you, therefore, uh, so just check it out. So therefore, because we were so good to you, please be favorable uh, towards my men, and since we come at a festive time, please give your servants and, and, your, son, and, and your son David whatever you can find for them. In other words, we helped you. Would you just be so kind as to return. Now we could talk about, you know, all kinds of motives and all that. Let's skip all that for right now. Um, anyway, uh, when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name, and then they waited. So they, they passed it along. Nabal answered David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse 
Many servants are breaking away from their, their masters these days. Why should I take my bread, water, and the meat I have slaughtered from my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? This is the mean, surly side of Nabal. And he's like, I'm not giving them anything. David's men turned around and went back. And you've just got to imagine the scene. You've got to be there for just a minute. They, 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 they've not, they're not used to being spoken to like this, okay? And this is not the way that you would treat somebody, the pow, power of David, and his men, and but he's just totally disrespected them. And uh, when they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, and here comes anger, okay? Uh, each of you strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped on his as well. About 400 went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. You, you see what's gonna come. This is full out war. This is, this is we're, we're gonna fight this out. How dare you disrespect me? How dare you speak down to my men? How dare you, all right? Uh, one of the servants told Abigail, uh, Nabal's wife, D David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greeting, but he hurled insults at them. Yet, yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they, they were a wall around us, and the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. N now, think it over and see what you can do, because disaster is hanging over our master in his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. And Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, a whole bunch of sheep, goats, did the whole nine yards. She goes, hurry up. She gets everything together and she goes on. She gets on her donkey. She rides. She comes up to David. And again, I'll just end the story. You can read this for yourself. She ends up uh, looking at David and says, uh, in not a harsh word, Harsh words have already been expressed. Said, my husband, um, yeah, that was really not smart. She said it a little stronger than that, but my husband's a fool. Uh, he shoots his mouth off. He doesn't control his tongue. He lets his anger just go loose. And it's an interesting irony because David's doing the exact same thing. As we all do, uh, when, again, when we're criticized, we feel like we're, somebody's condescending to us, somebody's putting our point of view down, somebody's putting us personally down, we we'll strike back. And Abigail, who, two things, beautiful and an intelligent woman, goes, I know how to head this problem off. And she simply said, um, forgive us. Uh, my, my husband should never have done this. And uh, so long story short, David goes, praise God you showed up. Because David would have lost men over this battle, but he would have had his vengeance. And he might personally have lost his own life. Who knows? But uh a gentle spirit turns away wrath. Harsh words stir up anger. You know, this is interesting because this theme is repeated over and over and over and again. I could spend an hour and a half. Uh, I won't do that. But let me just read a couple of passages from the book of Proverbs, all of them from the book of wisdom, okay? Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Proverbs 15, 8. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Proverbs 29, 22, an angry person stirs up conflict. A hot-tempered person commits many sins. So why are we talking about this? Folks, it is so easy right now to be so critical of everybody. And everybody's doing something stupid. Everybody, um, never when we're angry do we see our anger as what the actual problem is. I don't, I don't suppose you do. We justify our anger because this reason gave me the, you know, this was the impetus of why I'm so angry. And then we do stupid, stupid things and we say stupid things and we'll forever be held accountable for those things that we say and do. And, and, and so what I, I just want to slow us down is look, let's just talk about, let's talk about a reality. Why are we so angry right now? And again, let me just wrap this up by just causing you to think, why are we so angry? Number one, because we're bored. Number one, because we're bored. Uh, we're bored in the house and we're in the house bored. We are tired of uh, this coronavirus and we're, we're just bored. Um, we, our, our worlds have been shut down. You know, again, so many things have been taken away. You can't just go to the movies. You can't just go to the restaurants. You just can't, things are shut down. And, and so we're, we're, we're being stressed uh, to stay at home. And it's hard and it's hard for me. It's hard for you. Okay, we're bored. Number two, we're afraid. A fear is, is uh, 
taking its toll on us. We're, we're afraid, and we're afraid of a couple things. Number one, afraid of getting sick and the implications of that. We're afraid of uh, economic, the economic realities, and what does this mean for us in our lives? And, uh, uh, you know, fear can just, ma- you know, it grows and it magnifies. Um, we, and we could, we could keep talking about things that we're afraid of, but, but those, the, you know, that we're going to get sick or that somehow economically. Um, you, you know what a big one is? Is there's an overwhelming sense of a loss of control. And I'm telling you, I'm going through this as the pastor of this church, just a sense of a loss of control. I want so badly for us to regather. And yet again, as we've talked about on a number of occasions, doing that the right time, the right reason, right wisdom, all those things have to come together and we have to, you know, it has to be right. But I I don't like not having control. I don't. And I don't suspect that you do. But we're all kind of living in this tension where um, it just isn't the way we want it to be. And well, folks, control is always an illusion. All right. It's always an illusion because you, you and I really don't control anything. God does, which leads me to the fourth reason. Why are we so angry? Because truthfully, we probably lack faith in God, that God's got this, that it's, he's watching over us. If you walk with God, you have to understand that he, you are the apple of his eye. You mean more to him than you can You have words to express. He's watching over you, and nothing's going to happen to you that's outside his will, no, no, nor me, nor, nor my family, nor your family. He, he's, he's in control. He's got this. But this sense of, I don't have control, we normally live with the sense that we are in control. And folks, what this has taught us is we're not in control, but a lack of faith in God creates the, the cycle of fear and anger and angst, and, and we strike out. Listen, um, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. The, well, the least you can do is pray about it. Folks, the most we can ever do about anything is pray about it. All right? We just pray about it. And church, I, again, I, I, I'm so proud of you. And for so many reasons, for so long, you have held together. You, you're hanging in there. You're doing this. I know this is a really, really difficult time. I also know that uh, God's in control. And uh, it's going to be okay. I, I just believe that with all my heart. It's going to be okay. Now, it's longer than I would have guessed. It's diff- more difficult, all of that, but it's going to be okay. If we have faith in God, we can just calm down and, and, and we, can, we don't have to get all worked up. We don't have to get all angry. Uh, we don't have to get uh, against people and get critical. We just, God just helped me every day just to uh, make it through another day here. And one day in our lives, we're going to look back. And, and those of you who are younger, are going to tell your kids, you're going to tell your grandkids, about this crazy time that you lived through, that just as you grew up hearing about different seasons of things that happened before your life, you're going to tell your kids about this. And you're going to go, it was crazy, but we made it. Folks, we're going to make it. So let's pray and we'll be done. So God, I do pray that you cause us to understand that we don't control much of anything. And that is an absolute illusion. But if we get this out of kilter, we start to think that somehow we're going to fix this and, and that somehow if we just get on the right side and we have the right point of view, that somehow it's going to make it all better. The truth of the matter is, God, this will pass when you are ready to have it pass. And, and God, you, you're, not, you're not crippled by this. You're, you're not overwhelmed by this. This hasn't stumped you. And I, the longer it goes, the more I just believe with all my heart that this is exactly what you wanted to have happen for reasons I don't yet understand, but you're in control. So, God, I pray that you would calm us down. Help us to just not, not be so critical, not be so judgmental, not be so quick to speak our mind, give away a piece of our mind, which we can ill afford to lose. God, just to express it, our anger. God, within our hearts right now, again, I just pray that your spirit would just, your presence, your spirit, you're just, you just would envelop us with a sense of peace that um, it's going to be okay. And... Uh, God, help us to have the kind of wisdom that Abigail had, that uh, we don't need to stir things up. We need to calm things down. Help us to do that, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time.